The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody. Welcome to Yaron Brook Show on this Tuesday night. I hope everybody has gotten off a great uh, beginning of your weekend and you're having a great time and uh, pursuing your goals and your career and everything else. Anyway, today I thought we'd have a, uh, a fun program. Uh, we'll see how many movie buffs there are out there. You know, I, I uh, who knows if a show like this is uh, popular or interesting, and um, uh, and you know, we're, we're, there's a anyway, there's a, there's a lot to say about James Cameron. So uh, I'm I'm kind of excited to share uh, my thoughts about him. Uh, I've been watching his movies for a long, long time. Uh, we can, um, yeah, we'll, we'll look at his body of work. Uh, we'll basically go over all his main movies uh, since 1984, and I'll be commenting on all of them. I think, I'll just start by saying, I think James Cameron certainly is the most one of the most successful directors of the last 40 years. Uh, he, is, uh, he has done a number of blockbusters, particularly Terminator 2, Titanic, and Avatar were huge movies. I think this Avatar sequel is also doing quite well. Uh, it, he, he is uh, incredibly well-regarded. He is considered one of the, one of the, you know, the premier uh, directors in Hollywood for the last 40 years. What I find interesting about him is the journey he has taken, and I think what I want to present to you is a journey, a philosophical journey, an ideological journey. I think James Cameron is, I think, the most philosophical director of all the directors of the last 40 years, at least of all the mainstream, mainline directors. I'm not going to say they're not independent directors out there that are super philosophical, uh, but, uh, but he is, I think, uh, incredibly philosophical. I think his movies all have, all of them have uh, philosophical deep themes uh, and we will review those, and we will um, we will look at the trajectory, and maybe what is behind the trajectory, what is causing that trajectory, uh, and how that trajectory plays out. So he definitely comes to movies with a very particular view of the world, and and or, or did, and I think he's changed. And, and I think uh, I think the, the change happened between t uh, between Terminator Two and Titanic, and we'll 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 talk about that. And certainly from Titanic to Avatar, uh, so uh, I think that's what makes him interesting and worthy of talking about. Now, remember, uh, you know, objectivism believes that art and movies are certainly art. Uh, art is a recreation of reality, a, a, a selective recreation of reality based on an artist's metaphysical value judgment. What are metaphysical value judgments? Well, they're the answers to the questions like, um, you know, the nature of reality, what, what is reality like, and, but, but also what is my attitude towards reality? For example, is reality knowable? Is reason efficacious? Are my, are my uh, senses, uh, you know, uh, letting me know about the real world? Uh, so, can I succeed in reality? Is, uh, is success possible? Or is reality lined up against me and, and determined to, uh, to suppress me? Art is not primarily political. That is, while there might be politics in art, and we'll talk about the politics that comes through in the various, um, in the various movies and certain attitudes towards political issues that comes across in the various movies, in great art, that is not the essential. The essential is something much deeper. The essential is metaphysical, the nature of reality and the nature of man. Man's attitude towards reality is it, it and, and it, it really towards his ability to know reality, and uh, and his ability to cope with reality, his ability to to survive, to to thrive in reality, to begin with, to survive. And some of these movies. Uh, certainly about surviving, 
in a very hostile reality and uh, and uh, how that all that how all that plays out um, so take that into account as we go through the movies uh, it, it, you know we, we are going to look at exactly that at, at the kind of world that uh, Cameron creates the, the, the essential conflict that uh, he brings to the forward and then how does how do the heroes how do the the people at the center of the story uh, relate to that world? Is it a world that they can deal with? It is a world that they have control over. Is it a world that they can manage? Is it a world in which they can ultimately thrive, or they believe they can thrive? Um, so, uh, and and what is the tool? What is the tool for them to be successful? All right, that is kind of the 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 context. Movies. Uh, let me just say one more thing. M of all art forms, in my view, and, and again, everything I'm going to say here, this is not objectivism. This is Yaron Brook. Ayn Rand didn't see any James Cameron movies. I don't, I don't know that Leonard Peikoff ever did, and I don't know that he'd like any of them. Uh, and uh, so this is just, this is my views about movies and about these particular movies, uh, in particular these movies, um, and uh, my views about how to analyze movies, how to look at movies, and, and so on. So take that into account. Um, a loss is, uh, so what did I want to, I was going to say, yeah, also take into account the fact that I haven't watched any of these movies in quite a long time. So, uh, these movies, uh, I, I mean, I, I've watched them many times, at least up until Titanic, Titanic I've only watched once and Avatar I've only wa watched once, but all the other movies I've watched, I think at least three times each one of them, but a long time ago. Um, and so some of this is going to depend on my memory. If I miss a character, if I, you know, don't quite get the plot right, um, I apologize in advance. I, I think I think I'll get the I think I'll get the big picture right and and uh, and so on. Um, Catherine's going to be disappointed because Titanic is one of my least favorite movies of all time, uh, and we'll we'll get to that. And we'll get to why. Um, in uh, in a little bit, but we're not going to start with Titanic. We're going to start with Terminator. Uh, so, oh yes, I want to say this about movies. Uh, movies are the most complex of all art forms. They require so many different levels of artistry. Uh, there is storytelling. There is just a story like there would be in a, in a novel or a short story. There is acting. There is cinematography. And remember that movies are primarily stories told through images. Um, dialogue is important, but, but a lot of this is about the imaging. And I think one of the things that makes uh, Cameron so successful as a director is his ability to really, he, he, direct, he writes the movies, directs the movies, but he's also, I think, crucial to the, 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 look, and, the look of the movie and, and the, the cinematography of it. Uh, so there's, there's acting, there is cinematography, there's writing, there is coordinating all that through director. Uh, and of course, there's music. Music plays a huge role in movies. Uh, you know, I'm not sure who wrote the music in these, but for all, all, in all of these movies, um, the music has been fantastic. If you look at all of, all of his, even the ones I hate, uh, even, even in uh, Titanic, which I hate, the music is, is fantastic. The music adds to whatever the theme is, it adds to the drama, it adds to suspense, it adds to conflict, it adds to heroism when uh, there is uh, a heroic. And then of course, as one of Freeman said, there's sets and clothing and makeup, and, and makeup can be pretty amazing. And, and then there's special effects, particularly if you take a movie like Terminator 2 uh, and, and, the, and the evil in Terminator 2. There is amazing special effects that go into creating the illusions. And one of the things, if you look at Terminator 1 today, you'll kind of notice that the special effects are kind of dorky because it's, it's like watching the old Star Wars movies and they seem like kind of silly and, and ridiculous because the special effects were so used to amazing, stunning 
special facts that um, uh, that those just just thirty years ago, forty years ago movies look uh, just don't live up to kind of our modern our modern um, our modern standards. So uh, take into account that all of those factors, and I'm not going to get into all of those factors. Uh, again, I will say one of the things that makes James Cameron a particularly good director is he can take um, actors who are mediocre or worse and, and make them pretty good. A lot of the actors in uh, these movies uh, were not A-list actors. Um, I mean, The Abyss has some really good actors, and, and they already established aliens. Sigourney Weaver certainly was already established then. But the Terminator movies... Arnold Schwarzenegger is not a good actor, and yet he does very well in the Terminator movies. It's perfectly suited. He's well directed and well coached, and and he does very very well. Um, and and the rest of the uh, actors, the, the the child actor in Terminator Two and the others, are, are, are very good. So one of the one of the signs of great direction is the ability to. Uh, direct up to take actors and, and, and make them better and, and, uh, and improve of them. So that's, that's also something. I won't be talking about specifically in the movies, uh, but uh, all of these movies are well-made, well-directed, well-crafted. Uh, the cinematography is beautiful uh, and amazing. But, you know, we'll talk about that a little, little bit in Terminator. And, uh, and actually, in all of them. And, uh, and there's a story. And, and there's a story with an arc, and there's a story with a plot. They're all plot movies. They all have plots. Um, and there's real conflict. Uh, sometimes the conflict is just between good guys, but there's often real evil in these movies. Um, it's good versus evil. It's the other aspect of Cameron's pre-Titanic movies. It's always good versus evil. Uh, in Titanic, there's also good and evil, but he flips them around. Uh, and... Um, yeah, so so let's so let's uh, jump in. Uh, I'm getting a bunch of stuff on the music. James Horner, who is a very good music director, it was part of this. Uh, I guess there were others, but uh, all right. So let's start with Terminator because Terminator was James Cameron's first success. It was really it wasn't his first movie. I think there's a movie called uh, he, he made he, he directed and wrote Piranha Two, The Spawning. I never saw it. Not interested in seeing it, um, but uh, the first real movie, in a sense of a James Cameron movie, a movie that is his and that was is identified with him and was successful, and of course he made a sequel, um, is uh, is the is the uh, uh, the Terminator. Um, so let's start with that, uh, and and uh, I, I'm assuming most of you have seen the Terminator. Uh, Terminator basically is, is, is the story of a world in which uh, is the current world, the 1980s, in, in 1980s uh, where uh, two men appear from the future. One is a, is a cy cyborg that is there to kill a particular woman, Sarah Connor, and the other is a man there to protect Sarah Connor, and the idea is that uh, he is there to protect Sarah Connor, but Sarah Connor, because, and, and, and a cyborg is there to kill Sarah Connor, because in the future, uh, a uh, AI computer, artificial intelligence computer developed by a particular corporation, Skynet, uh, an intelligence defense network, actually goes, uh, becomes uh, conscious. And Skynet basically musters the resources of all the computers in the world, and attacks human beings and destroys human civilization. Um, this is the fate of Chat GPT. Uh, just it, it, it's kind of a stupid Skynet, uh, but Skynet basically takes over the world and tries to annihilate human beings. And in the future, there is this war between Skynet and the survivors, human survivors. And in that war, there is a uh, a, a crucial. Um, you know, a crucial um, uh, commander who uh, Skynet deems as the, the key, uh, the only chance of the humans winning is through this commander, uh, you know, John, it turns out he's John Connor, 
uh, John, who's uh, who's in the future, and uh, what what is happening here. And look, uh, remember that um, uh, time time travel movies are always filled with contradictions. So don't start on the contradictions with me. This is full of contradictions. Uh, all the Terminator movies are, it's, it's silly in some way. This is why time travel is silly. But you just have to buy it. It's a movie, it's a story, and the movie and the story are telling a bigger story than that. Anyway, the cyborg is there to kill the mother before the child is born, so that if John O'Connor is never born, then Skynet is going to crush human beings and take over the world and succeed. Why exactly he wants to crush human beings and do all this? Who knows, but that, you know, but that, that's it. So start with a pretty pessimistic uh, uh, projection about, the, about future technology. And, and in, every one of, in every one of the movies, with the exception of, with every single one of the movies, with the exception of True Lies and uh, The Abyss, there is a future in which there is horror to be found. Something really, really, really bad is happening in the future. And often that something really, really bad is technological, it's tech. Uh, at least that, it, that is uh, the case in, um, in, um, in the Terminator movies. Uh, and uh, human beings are fighting uh, that evil that is in the future with uh, whatever tools that they have. We see that in the Abyss, we see that in Terminator, um, and uh, in... You know, we'll, we'll get to see that, sorry, in Aliens and Terminator movies. So uh, basically the movie, this movie is an action movie. It's a survival movie. It's uh, Sarah Connor and the soldiers come from the past, from the future, uh, to try to save her. They are combating this cyborg. And this cyborg is almost indestructible. Almost indestructible. And when he kills somebody he can take over that person's voice so that, uh, you know, any communications by voice only, uh, he can fool you. Uh, and, and, uh, and he, you know, obviously he kills without, uh, without thinking. There's no thinking. He's a machine. He's there to do one thing and one thing only. And, and Arnold Schwarzenegger plays the cyborg and he plays it really, really well. The movie is shot, directed in a way that this is relentless. This is, the, 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 you are really with Sarah Connor trying to survive, and this machine is coming after and after and after. And, and no matter what she does, she blows him up and shoots him, and, 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 and uh, the, the soldier Kyle Reese shoots him, and, and all this stuff. It, it keeps coming, and it keeps coming, and it keeps coming. And in that sense, there's a bit of a horror movie aspect to it. Um, and it's, it's dramatic and exciting and thrilling and scary and um, and you're just wrapped up in it and it's it's harder it's harder not watch and it's 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 completely engaging and it's it's just a good movie and it's 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 really a um, it's really an action movie and it's an it's a good action movie it's just a good simple action movie what you start to get in this action movie is uh, two things one is this prime this real conflict between technology or aliens or some evil that exists out there, some conflict and human beings. And then in this movie and in almost all of James Cameron's movies, again, until he gets to Avatar, human beings can't survive. Human beings are competent, able. I mean, Sarah Connor is just a regular lady. She's, she's, just, she's just a regular person. And yet, she rises the occasion, she becomes heroic, she becomes a woman of action. Kyle Reese teaches her how to do this and, and she embraces that. Uh, she is a fighter and she is determined to survive and ultimately have this child and she will face up to this cyborg and destroy it, right? And I'm not gonna give the ending away, but I don't think it's a mystery. Um, and, 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 and she fights, and, and she uses her mind, not as explicitly as we'll see uh, in, the, in, in Aliens, but she's, you know, Kyle and her are constantly thinking, they're constantly planning, they're constantly figuring out how to evade the cyborg and ultimately how to destroy it. 
That is not as explicit as it becomes later on in, in later movies. Um, but we already see a signature of cameras that is the efficacious hero, the hero of action guided by a mind and guided by values, life being the primary, but the life of a child as, as, a, as, as an added value. So Sarah is a valuer. She's rational. At least she becomes rational. She becomes more competent. She becomes more able. All driven, all focused by the values that she discovers and as she discovers the strength within her, in herself. And this is all done while the suspense is amazing and the pace is relentless and it's exciting and interesting and challenging. There's always this overlay of a little bit of kind of pessimism. Uh, you know, the future is bleak. The future from which Kyle Reese has come and in which John Connor is a hero is bleak. Can that future be changed? This movie doesn't answer that. But there is this idea that there is real evil out there. Things can go really, really bad. Bad stuff, really bad stuff can happen. But human beings can and will deal with it. Human beings are competent. The world, and again, the world is knowable. Human beings have the ability to survive within it. Human beings have the ability to be heroic, heroic in it, and to rise to the occasion, to rise uh, to the challenge. All right, let's see, are there any Terminator 1 movie uh, uh, questions here? Michael says, uh, Michael says, Terminator 1 is one of my favorite movies, even though he copied from Holland Ellison, also one of the best love stories, in my opinion, thoughts. Yes, I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's a very good action movie. Um, it's one of the best. It's, it starts a whole genre of movies like this where the suspense builds and builds and you, you think you've killed the monster and it keeps coming back and, uh, it, 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 and it's brilliantly done and uh, he, he, he plays with the time travel as well as you can play with time travel. Uh, and then there is um, and, and, and there was a love story embedded in it. I, 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 again, I'm trying not to give it away, trying not to give the whole plot away, but um, there, is a, there is a love story embedded in this. Um, importantly, Sarah Connor at the end of this movie is driving off um, into the, the desert, pregnant, basically with the idea that she is going to train her son in survivalist skills. She is going to train her son um, to be the man he's supposed to be, to be the man who can fight Skynet. And maybe she can figure out how to prevent the future from happening. But, but that's... That's in Terminator 2. That's for the future. But it's a terrific love story. It's a fantastic action movie. And it's got, I think if it was just Terminator and that was it, then you'd say, yeah, good action movie. It's got some good themes, but nothing special. But then when you think of it in terms of James Cameron's movies, it gains more philosophical meaning in terms of man's efficaciousness and, 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 and the, 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 his, his ability to defeat evil. Uh, Cameron made uh, Terminator in 1984. Uh, in 1986, he made Aliens. Now, Aliens is a sequel. It is uh, a sequel to Alien, which was made uh, a few years earlier. Uh, Alien was made by, 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 um, his name has just slipped my mind. Somebody out there will tell me who Alien uh, was made by a famous director. Uh, who has a particular style, also one of, one of the, Ridley Scott, thank you, Ridley Scott, was made by Ridley Scott, who's also a, a phenomenal director with a particular style, uh, much, much darker than James Cameron, at least, again, pre-Titanic. Pre, uh, uh, um, pre, uh, alien, the first one, the Ridley Scott alien is very dark. It's very depressing. It's evil is out there. Maybe human beings could survive, but not really. This is overwhelming. It's overpowering. 
uh, you can somehow eke by. Everything is dark. The set is dark. The way it's filmed is dark. Everything is depressing. Sigoni Weave is depressing. Alien is one of the most oppressive, claustrophobic, scariest movies ever. And, and it ends with no kind of positive resolution. Aliens, which is the sequel, is the same basic story, but much more philosophical and, and much more positive. So uh, the, the fundamental story here is there's an alien that's occupying this planet. Uh, the alien is one that basically uh, the way, I mean, this is brilliant in terms of evil, but this is not James Cameron. This is, this is uh, Ridley Scott. But the alien um, implants an egg inside uh, its, uh, its victim's stomach Therefore, the victim now becomes, uh, you know, basically is fertilizing the egg. And then when, it's, when, the, when the egg kind of, when the egg matures, uh, the new alien bursts through the human stomach or whatever the, 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 the host uh, is. So it, 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 this is an alien that is parasitic. And, and, and parasitic, anything parasitical has, has, has a certain real evil to it, a, a real malevolence to it, because it's, it's using your body to harm you, right? It's, it, it, and it's, so it's, it's, it's particularly scary, and I think uh, particularly effective as, a, um, as an evil force in a movie, and is, is very, very, very effective, I think, in the Alien movies. And it's a long franchise. I, I don't think very many good Alien movies were made after, after the second one, James Cameron's one. Um, I think the first and second one are definitely excellent movies. Um, anyway, the, the second one stars Sigourney Weaver. Uh, she, she, she stars in the first one. She stars in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, I think, as well. But in this one, she's going back to the planet with a crew. She's going to this planet with a crew. They think the aliens are gone. Um, there's, a girl, uh, there, there, there's a girl, I guess. Uh, I guess there was a, there was a, um, a, a station on this, island, uh, on this planet um, uh, there's a station on this planet with humans and they have gone dark. So they go in and what they discover that this planet is infested with the same aliens that Sigourney Weaver encountered in the first movie. Now, what this movie is, is just a horror action movie where basically the aliens are constantly chasing this team around, trying to uh, destroy them, trying to use them as, as hosts for the alien, and there are these horrific scenes where this is happening. And, uh, you know, if you don't have a, 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 a strong stomach for uh, gore and violence, Aliens is probably not a good movie for you. But it is incredibly effective. Uh, James Horner wrote the music to this. It's, it's really suspenseful. It's really exciting. It's one of the most exciting movies you'll ever see. You're at the edge of your seat. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill Paxton is great. Sigourney Weaver is great. She's really good in this. Um, and, uh, you know, let's see. Uh, um, yeah, James Cameron, again, directed this. He also wrote it. He wrote the screenplay. Um, this is, this is a, a great movie making. This is how you make a suspenseful, exciting horror slash action movie. Sci-fi. Of course, it's sci-fi because they're out in space. But what makes this movie stand out is the, is the characters that surround uh, Sigourney Weaver. Every one of the characters that surround Sigourney have a different attitude towards how to deal with this alien. Every one of them has a different attitude on how to deal with reality. Everyone brings, if you will, a different epistemology to the story. Uh, this is, by the way, a theme you'll see again in the abyss. In Aliens, every one of the people around her have a different view. So uh, uh, there is the uh, greedy corporate guy, right? The greedy corporate guy who just wants to, um, he wants to catch this alien. He's sure that if he brings it back to corporate headquarters, they could make a fortune off of this. They could figure out the secrets of the universe from this. They could discover all kinds of things. And he basically evades constantly the sheer evil that this alien is and 
its power and its strength and its ability to evade human beings and detection and uh, the guns and, and, and how dominant this thing is. And his, he's going to take it on a spaceship and he's going to take it to a new planet where he can lay eggs in human beings again. And he's a complete evader. He's the first character in a James Cameron movie who is the corporate guy who represents that corporate evil, that, 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 that the, the evil of corporations. Uh, James Cameron politically is clearly on the left and always has been on the left. And we'll, we'll see that uh, morph into full revelation with Titanic and, um, and Avatar. But he is a man of left. He, he's suspicious of, he's definitely suspicious of corporate power. Uh, remember, Skynet was created by corporations, so by, by corporation and the, I guess the military industrial complex. And in Aliens, it's a corporation that tends to go and weave in. It's never clear what the goals are, what the purpose is. And the guy who's trying to bring the specimen back is a complete evader. Complete evader. Um, uh, Ash the Android was the first in Alien. I'm not sure the first what. Yes, Ash, there's an Android. There's also this thing in, the, in Aliens about whether you can trust an Android, whether an Android can be good. And, and in Aliens, he is, so he's trustworthy. So this is kind of a, a little hint at Cameron's optimism about technology. Once in a while, it comes through this positive view, this optimism about technology that comes through in his early movies, it comes, certainly comes through here. And in the character of Ash, in the character of the android. Um, so you have one character who's an, a corporate evader, who's just who's a pragmatist. The essential characteristic of this guy, he's a pragmatist. We just need to get, get you know, solve this little problem right now here. We can't think in principle, we can't think long term, we can't really take into account all the facts, who knows? Then you've got some of the troops around Sigourney Weaver. One of them is, is just panicky. He just, he just goes into hysteria every time the alien comes close. He dies very, very quickly. Um, uh, others clearly can't think. They clearly are uh, confused and distracted. And, uh, you know, maybe they can follow orders, but they don't know whose orders to follow. And they're just not focused and they're not good thinkers. They die pretty early. By the way, everybody in the movie who dies, dies because of an epistemological flaw. All of them. I mean, that's one of the great things about this movie, is all the bad thinkers die. The one soldier who survives is the soldier who recognizes that Sigourney Weaver is the only real leader here. That Sigourney Weaver is a manifestation of rationality in the face of complete disaster. Sigourney is constantly stopping and, and, and thinking, planning, strategizing, in the face of horror, in the face of massive uncertainty, in the face of just the, the most evil force out there. She is constantly thinking, weighing, judging, trade-offs, figuring out best alternatives. She is one of the most heroic characters you'll ever see in a movie. Just amazing. I mean, she's not particularly, uh, you know, this is not a movie in which the hero is cheerful or happy or successful or anything like that. The hero survives. That's the only point of it. And at, at some point, they discover a little girl who survived. And, and a lot of this is about the attachment of Sigourney Weaver to the little girl and Sigourney, uh, you know, uh, fighting not only for her own survival, but for the survival of the little girl, similar to in Terminator, the, 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 the mother fighting for the survival of the unborn, the, the child that's yet to be born. Uh, the scene's amazing. Uh, again, uh, it's, it's exciting. Uh, the, 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 the nature of the alien as a parasitic alien makes him so much more evil than just a monster kind of clawing at you. Right? He doesn't want to kill you, this monster. He wants to keep you alive so he can hatch his eggs inside of you. I mean, can you think of anything more uh, disgusting than that? And then, of course, Sigoni is, is this epitome of, of, of heroism. So amazing. 
Um, and again, you can see uh, you can see that James Cameron admires rationality. He admires reason. He admires competence. Um, he he believes that human beings can survive in this world, can th can achieve in this world, can overcome unbelievable odds, can overcome uh, uh, you know uh, unbelievable problems, unbelievable evil in this world. In that sense, again, I think Aliens is an optimistic movie, uh, a positive movie about human ability, human capabilities in the face of the most horrific of evils. All right, that is James Cameron in um, 1986. In 1989, Cameron makes The Abyss. Abyss is an interesting story. It has a terrible ending, partially because the ending brings out some of the obvious uh, uh, political ideas of James Cameron, which uh, I, I have always been best uh, unsaid. Um, and it's just a, it's just a clumsy ending. It's, it's, he didn't know how to end it, and there are like three different endings. Uh, the first one is just confusing, and, and the ultimate director's cut ending is... Um, You know, is uh, it's not confusing, but it's just it's it's pretty bad. All right, uh, so there, there's an American submarine sinks in the Caribbean. Um, they send a U.S. search and recovery team uh, that works on an oil platform. These are deep deep uh, divers. Uh, they're trying to get the boat, the, the American submarine, before the Russians do. Um, it has uh, advanced technologies. Remember, this is 1989, so it's still the Cold War. Uh, and um, they are, so they are down in, in these massive depths. Uh, the, the team that's down there is primarily the team that's, that's been working on this oil rig. These are, these are oil rig guys. Uh, they, they, are, they are experts at what they do. They are the best people in, in deep sea diving. Uh, but they're hard-nosed, reality-focused uh, guys. And then a, a, a kind of a... A Navy SEALs team is, is sent down, but, but on the way down, the Navy SEALs team, something happens, and, and they, they, get, uh, they get, you know, you get the sickness if you, if you, if you descend too quickly. Uh, you, you, you get the sickness that can affect, you can, that can affect your, and the leader of that team clearly gets affected by this and becomes, as we'll see, uh, somewhat paranoid. In addition... Um, joining them in this expedition is the ex-wife, I think, of um, the Ed Harris character, who's, who's, who's the, the lead, the guy who runs this team. She's a, an excellent actress who I don't think we saw enough of in the 80s and 90s because she was really good. But, so too bad she didn't act in more movies. Uh, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantoni. Tonio. Tonio. Mastrantonio. Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio, who's a really good actress, she is kind of the scientist. She's the brains behind the operation. Now, again, every one of these characters brings a different epistemology to, um, uh, to what they're doing. Now, at some point during the attempt to salvage the submarine, they encountered... Uh, they encountered... Um, they encounter an alien, an alien being, underwater. And this is what makes, I think, the movie so interesting, is that every one of the characters views this alien differently. They all have fundamentally the same facts. They're all seeing the same thing. And I think, uh, I think the character uh, of uh, Mary Mastriani is the only one that actually touches uh, the, the, the alien, but they're all seeing the same thing. They all have the same data. And everybody comes to different conclusions about it. Um, the woman, the scientist, she again represents reason and rationality. She, she is curious. She recognizes this as, as an amazing thing. She recognizes this as as, as world-changing. She recognizes this as something she wants to investigate. She wants to know more. 
and, and she wants to discover more about it. She's curious, and she's open. She's open to all possibilities. But she also makes the case that, look, if this was a hostile being, it would attack them, and it hasn't attacked them. It hasn't shown any signs of aggression towards them. And Harris's character is a little bit more skeptical, but also is smart enough, rational enough, to respect her judgment and to respect rationality and to be rational himself. And therefore, he is definitely on the side of, yeah, this is exciting. This is thrilling. Let's figure this out. Let's understand what's going on here and, and, uh, and, and why, what it's doing, what it's capable of, what is happening exactly. And his character is really interesting. I mean, he's a, he's a kind of a, a, a rough uh, old rig operator, but also really smart and, and, and co incredibly courageous. And, and a number of things that happen underwater. It's, again, there are no villains here in this movie. Um, the characters that are wrong and mistaken, but they're no villains. There's no evil in this movie. Everything is positive in this movie. It, well, I mean, there's conflict, but there's no evil. And the amount of drama and suspense is unbelievable. It's breathtaking. I mean, the, 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 this, and it's claustrophobic because it's underwater. So instead of being in space, it's underwater. Brilliantly made until the ending. And, and beautifully made and exciting. And again, every character, different. Every character. So you've got another character who is a conspiracy theory nut. And everything's a conspiracy. This alien some kind of conspiracy related to the, to the submarine and the Russians and something there's going on. And others, they don't trust this thing. It's going to kill us. It's going to do something with us. We need to destroy it. We need to annihilate it. Um, but they are also hard-nosed, fact-based, reality-based kind of uh, oil platform guys, right? And they're not going to rush to anything. They want more evidence. They want to study. They want to figure it out. And they respect that character, that Mary character and Ed Harris's character. They respect them. And they are, they're willing to, they're, you know, they're, they're, so they're open. They're open, right? Both of those. And, um, but then you have uh, the Navy SEAL. Now, the Navy SEAL has become paranoid. And the nice thing about the movie is the movie doesn't make him out to be a bad guy. The movie makes him out to be, in a sense, a sick guy. He's, he's got this diver's sickness, and now it's made him super paranoid. And he is convinced this thing is a danger. He, he, communication is broken. They can't communicate with the outside world, so they have to make all decisions themselves. And... Um, this is a Russian plot. This is a, an alien that's going to destroy human life. And there's no time. And ultimately, he attempts to destroy the alien. Sam Harris, you know, goes out to save it. And that's where things get complicated with the plot. But Sam ha but Ed Harris, or not Sam Harris, Ed Harris. Ed Harris's character is super, super um, heroic. Uh, one of Freeman said it's the bends. Yes, decompression sickness is called the bends, and that's what he has. Um, it, it, this is a really uh, terrific movie. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It's well made. Again, very suspenseful, very exciting. Again, philosophical. Clearly, the heroes of the movie are the rational scientist and the rational diver Ed ha that Ed Harris um, uh, portrays and they are they are the good guys and what makes them good is the thinkers again this notion that human beings can't survive they can't thrive aliens don't have to be monsters aliens don't have to be against us at the end of the movie the aliens turn out to be here to help the uh, humankind and they they help us, you know, but there's a whole section there about it, about how bad human beings are and should the aliens destroy us because of how bad we've been. Um, and they, they, choose to, they choose to preserve us because they, they identify some, I don't know, love or sacrifice. Uh, actually, I think it's Ed Harris's willingness uh, to basically commit suicide in order to, in order to, to save uh, the, the, the alien that I think convinces the alien that human beings are worthy of surviving. Something like that. That's why it's kind of a silly ending. 
Um, so I think excellent movie, again, again, without the ending. Um, and uh, a portrayal of human beings as efficacious and rational and competent and able. And I think that's ultimately the theme of the movie. All right, so that's The Abyss, 1989. In 1991, um, Cameron probably makes his, uh, his best movie um, and the movie that, that kind of defines that early part of his career that wraps it all together, um, and that is uh, Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Uh, Terminator 2, Judgment Day is a story of Sarah Connor and now her, uh, her, her son, who's, I don't know what, 12, 13, something like that, maybe younger, maybe a little older, I'm not sure. Uh, Sarah Connor's trying to convince the world that Skynet is going to destroy the world, that Skynet is going to go live, that Skynet, and, and she's trying to convince people, and they all think she's crazy, and they institutionalize her, and she's gone nuts. I think, I think the beginning of the movie with her being nuts is probably the weakest part of the movie. There's no indication at the end of the first one that she's going to go crazy, or that she will do some of the irrational things she seemed to be doing to try to convince people of this. But it's somewhat understandable that she's doing this, because um, uh, she is so frantic about what she knows is going to happen. What she knows human beings are driving towards this unbelievable fate and nobody will listen to her. Nobody will take her seriously. Um, she, uh, at the same time, again, uh, two, uh, two, People, not people, two cyborgs come back from the future to her time. Now, this is, uh, this is again, her son is, is, is a young teen. Uh, one is Arnold Schwarzenegger coming back. But this time, Arnold is one of the good guys. Arnold is a uh, cyborg uh, programmed by John Connor in the future to go back and protect the young John Connor and the mother and make sure John Connor survives so that he can go on to lead the assault on Skynet in the future. But Skynet sends back a much, much, much more uh, sophisticated cyborg, um, uh, Robert Patrick. And I think part of the genius of this movie uh, is the special effects that make this particular cyborg so menacing and so evil. If you think about it, the most evil thing you can think of, not evil, in the, the, the most frightening reality, the most frightening thing you can think of is something without reality, or not without reality, without identity. Something that can become anything. Something that can be anything. Something that cannot be destroyed. Something that takes any shape possible. And that's what this new cyborg is. It has no, in a sense, moving parts. It's made of liquid. And this liquid can take any shape. It can take a human shape. It can become a machine. It can become half machine, half human. It can take on anybody's appearance, not just now the voice, which the Schwarzenegger could do in, in, in the first one. But now it can take on any identity. It's, a, it's, it's the closest you can get. Of course, it has identity, this liquid. But it's the closest one can get to, it's the closest one can get to something that lacks identity. And it is scary. And it appears to be indestructible because it can take any shape possible. And it can survive. One little drop of this liquid can survive and reform and come after you. So again, in a sense, it's a chase movie. Arnold Schwarzenegger is now protecting Sarah Connor. Now there is the kid involved. And there is this much more sophisticated, much more evil um, in its, I mean, it's not evil, it's a machine, but representing evil, coming after them. So in that sense, it's very similar to Terminator 1, and it's, it's, a, it's an incredible action movie. It's got some fantastic scenes. It's got some great car chases. In every respect, it is a, a, one of the great action movies of all time, one of the great sci-fi action movies of all time. Uh, and it's beautifully made movies. I mean, everything, every aspect of it 
is uh, fantastic in terms of movie making. But what really sets it apart is uh, the theme of the movie. It's not now, if you will, just reason and rationality and the ability of human beings to survive and overcome. Suddenly, all of that is there. But now is there's the explicit recognition, the explicit recognition of free will, of choice, of one's ability to shape one's future, of one's ability to change the future. It is a complete repudiation of determinism, explicitly stated in the movie. So it's not just left for implication, as it is in all these other movies. Anytime you, you elevate reason, you're elevating, in a sense, human free will. Every, any, any, anytime people are in a position to make choices. But here, it's literally Sarah Connor has to deal with, can I change the future? If I can change the future, how can I change it? Part of this is finding a scientist, a, a, a program, an advanced program who's programming Skynet, and convincing him that this is the path, the path is disaster, and that he can change that path. And his willingness to change, his willingness to, to accept what Sarah is telling him, and to change the path. This is by far the most optimistic of all of James Cameron's movies, not only in terms of the human being's ability to survive the evil, to destroy the evil, but also to change his fate and to change the future and to set humanity on a path for success, on a path for avoiding the worst evil. Again, there this anti-corporation hints, it's there in uh, Aliens, it's even in the Abyss, representatives of the corporation are always pragmatists, and it's here in Terminator 2, the corporation is building Skynet no matter what, but it's also an attack of the government that is helping build Skynet no matter what. So it, it's, 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 it, it really is a, a terrific movie. One of the few movies where the theme is uh, free will, in that sense, it's a, you know, I think all of these movies of Cameron's are romantic movies, the, the, the uh, romantic in the sense of expressing the idea that people have choices, that they can they shape their own future. Um, the, 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 the big differences in what makes Terminator better is that in Terminator, Sarah Connor is guiding the action. In Terminator, in the first Terminator movie, it's all about surviving this threat. The, 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 the threat is guiding the action. In the second movie, in, in Aliens, it's again, the threat and Sigourney Move is surviving it. And, and it, the threat is really determining the, action, the actions. The Abyss, it's not much of a, it's not really a threat, it's more the wonder, you know, what a beautiful world, what an amazing world, and how do we deal with it. Uh, but Terminator, and, and, and there, it's kind of this appearance of an alien that's guiding the action. But here, the hero, Sarah Connor, is driving the action. Now, it's in the face of a threat, but it's in the face of a global threat, and then this particular threat of the cyborg come to kill her. But there's this global threat now, and she is trying to change it all. She's driving. She, at some point, feels like she's constantly playing defense, and then she goes on the offense. And that going on the offense is her changing the terms. It is her taking her own life into her own hands, the world into her own hands, and saying, no, we can change this. We can guide this in a different direction. We can have an impact here. We have free will. This is not determined or destined to happen. And then she goes and she finds the scientist. She now is driving the action. And in that sense, all of these early movies of uh, James Cameron are romantic movies. Um, and um, uh, anyway, uh, uh, you know, they're all romantic and they all respect human choices, human ability to think, human abilities to change their fate. All right, I think those are James Cameron's four great movies, and, uh, and those are all positive philosophically and all, um, you know, I think they're terrific movies, and I highly recommend them. The fifth movie 
It's True Lies, which was made in 1994. Uh, th you know, uh, uh, what is it? Um, when was Terminator made? In 91. So this is three years after Terminator. This is a fun project more than anything else. It's not a serious movie. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a comedy. It's uh, a movie that... Um, uh, a couple and, and or a couple where, where uh, you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger um, plays. Uh, he, he's a he's a spy, but he's a, he's this boring guy in normal life, and then he turns out that he's a spy, and then his wife discovers this, and there are Muslim terrorists out there, and it's just a it's just an action movie. It's a ridiculous action movie. It's an action comedy. It's funny. Um, I think Jamie Lee Curtis is. Uh, terrifically sexy in this movie. She's not usually sexy, but in this movie, she's quite sexy. Uh, Tom Arnold is in the movie. Bill Paxton is back. Um, and, uh, and Arnold is terrific. And it's just fun. This is just a fun movie. It's, it's, it's benevolent, and the good guys win, and uh, Arnold is efficacious, and so is his wife. And Yeah, she's, uh, she is in A uh, Fish Called Wanda, too. That's right. Um, so I recommend this movie just for fun. It, 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 it's, it, it, there's no deep theme here. Um, it's, it's, it's a comedy. It makes fun of, uh, I think, funny things, uh, of, 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 of the silliness out there. And it's, it's, just, it's just a, uh, so just go and have, go and enjoy it. All right, so now we come to Titanic. So Titanic is made three years later, and it's as if, uh, you know, uh, uh, James Cameron wants to make a serious movie and he wants to make a movie uh, that is not part of this genre that he has made. It's not sci-fi. Um, all the other movies were sci-fi. It's not action. Uh, you know, True Lies was action. Uh, but this is like a, a serious drama. And it's about a story he's obviously intrigued by, is interested in, which is the Titanic wreck. Um, uh, you know, in... Um, uh, he actually shot footage of the actual Titanic wreck in 1995. He was interested in this story. He's interested in what happens there. But this is a movie that, where James Cameron is now bringing to the forefront, rather than uh, this deep view of, of, of what human beings are capable of, this positive view of humanity, uh, now he's starting to turn pessimistic and he's starting to turn negative about humanity. And he's also, um, he, he's also letting his politics override all else. And this becomes a, a, a really a political movie because in a sense, the story is set. There's not much he can do with the story. The story is the story of the Titanic. Um, it, 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 by the very nature of the way he's telling the story, it's going to be a tragedy. That is, the, 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 the hero, or the, the kind of hero that we have here, uh, who is played by Leonardo DiCaprio, it, you know, is probably not going to survive. But the movie is, is one of the most explicitly uh, and visually Marxist movies I've ever seen. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's up there with uh, some of the movies of, um, uh, what's the name, the guy who did uh, Wall Street, uh, who is an explicit Marxist, and it does Marxist movies. I, I don't know that James Cameron will call himself an explicit Marxist, but it comes across. There's some default pessimism, resentment of capitalism, and, 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 and resentment of, 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 of um, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, yes, resentment of wealth, uh, that comes across, Oliver Stone, thank you, that comes across uh, in this movie, um, in, in Titanic. Um, what's the story? The story is, uh, you know, rich people are taking uh, the Titanic on a cruise. Some, there's some uh, poor people who've managed to get on, uh, and they, the Titanic is built in a way as the rich have, have the upper decks, and then as you go lower down, you get you get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and poor and then at the bottom at the very bottom are the people shoveling the coal into the fire uh, to keep the thing going and there's, it's a very Marxist imagery it's a pyramid it's it's and there's there's a there's a shot in the movie where he's cross sectionally going through the through the ship and it's it's very visually and viscerally the the, the rich are exploiting everybody beneath 
and everybody's exploiting these poor workers who are actually shoveling the coals. And they're, of course, they're going to be the first ones to die uh, when the, when the, when the uh, Titanic sinks. And, of course, the people who are going to survive, who, who do survive, are the, are the rich who get first dibs at the, uh, at the um, uh, life, uh, lifeboats. And, of course, they're not life, lifeboats for everybody because the assumption is who cares about the poor and the poor are all going to drown. And that's why, um, uh, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio's character has to drown because he is... He has to die because he, is, he represents the poor here. He represents virtue, virtue that's sinking, virtue that's dying. The Titanic, more broadly, represents kind of the death of the 19th century. It represents man's arrogance before nature, man thinking they can build an invincible machine, and nature defeats it. Think about all the other movies in which men overcome horrific aliens, horrific machines, Skynet, they, they fight these unbelievable odds, but then in Titanic, it is an iceberg that defeats men and defeats the, the greatest machine they had ever built to that point in time. It's exactly flip of the philosophy of all these other movies. Here, human beings are impotent before nature. They're incapable of dealing with disaster. And I think what he's attributing that impotence to is this kind of exploitative world in which they live. There's a love story. Leonardo DiCaprio is a poor kid. Um, Kate Winslet is a spoiled rich girl. And they fall in love. And of course, Leonardo DiCaprio is a good guy. She's the spoiled rich girl. And, and DiCaprio is trying to teach her about life. She knows nothing about life. So he's teaching her about life. And, and of course, poor people know about life. Rich people have no clue about life, particularly rich kids. They don't have any clue about life. So he's teaching about life. And one of the scenes that I find really despicable um, uh, is a scene in which the thing that Leonardo DiCaprio teaches Kate Winslet is how to spit. And a big deal is made out of he's teaching her how to spit because real men, real people, people connected to reality spit. That's what they do. And, and rich people are not connected enough to, to this world. So it, it's just the whole setup, the, 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 the way the wealthy are portrayed, the way they're portrayed as the boat is sinking, the way they're portrayed as getting on the lifeboats, uh, the way they're portrayed before that, just the kind, of, the kind of atmosphere, the life that they're engaged in, all of that, is so horrible and so pathetic and so anti-man and anti-life. And again... Man in the 20th century, sophisticated man, the men who built machines and built tools like the Titanic are defeated by an iceberg. And that's what the movie is about. So I, I think Titanic is a horrible movie. I, I didn't enjoy it at all. I didn't like the DiCaprio character. I didn't like the Kate Winslet character. I didn't like this Marxist, the, the visuality of it. I didn't like anything about it. I thought the love story was cliche and, and mediocre and, um, it, you know, nothing special and nothing unique about it, about the love story. It's the same. I'd seen that love story like a hundred times in previous movies, much better done. Nothing, nothing really interesting about it. Uh, again, elevating poverty over wealth at every opportunity and elevating nature above technology at every opportunity. That's what Titanic represents technology. The iceberg represents nature. Nature destroys technology every time. Nature beats it. Ex exact opposite of aliens. Exact opposite of Terminator. The opposite of the abyss. People here are helpless. Yeah, they try to save this. They try to save that. They, I mean, you know, he saves the girl. The girl survives. He dies. At that point, I was just wanting everybody to just sink and shut up. Um, it, 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 I really, 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 I mean, it's not that I, yeah, good movie, didn't like, I really hated that movie. Uh, and, and I really think it's, it's not a good movie. And it's, it's, it, it plays on every cliche and drums at the heartstrings and plays the love story. And it's got the, the famous Titanic, you know, at the front of the ship. And it's got the amazing music. Who wrote the music to this, uh, um, yeah, James Horner, beautiful music. I mean, 
I hated it. I found it boring and I found it annoying, annoying. Uh, I mean, beautifully made, beautiful music, you know, pseudo romantic, no choices here. Because there are no choices. Because the iceberg's going to hit the boat and the boat's going to sink. We all know that. We know that from the beginning of the movie. So choices don't matter. I mean, yes, DiCaprio ca sacrificed in order to save Kate Winslet. But every guy would do the same thing. There's, there's nothing... Oh, yeah, there's Celine Dion. It's just trivial. Drivel. Sorry. Not a good movie. But the next movie that James Cameron makes, makes Titanic look like, you know, the greatest pro-humanity movie ever made. Because the next movie Cameron makes completes his complete reversal of his philosophy, of his ideas, of, of his approach to reality. I mean, Avatar, which was made in 2009, is in everything anti man, anti-humanity. It is a movie that portrays human beings and human technology as inherently destructive. See, when you make a movie, you make choices. You choose a particular story. In this case, a story about human beings not caring one iota about other sentient, conscious, cognitive beings, ignoring them, ignoring their life and, and their conscious and their knowledge. It turns out that there's knowledge there. All in the name of destruction. All in the name of, quote, greed. All in the name of pragmatism. There's not a single human being in Avatar. Human. Other than the, the one hero, and we'll get to him in a minute. Who is worth the title human being? They're all scum. All of them. I mean, again, movies are not about politics. You can be a libertarian and have a, a, have a, a wrong sense of life. You can be a libertarian and not understand movies. You can be a libertarian and, and be attracted to schmaltz. It doesn't mean you have aesthetic values that, you know, again, art is not about politics. Art is not essentially politics. But I will tell you, uh, both Avatar and... Uh, and um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, Titanic are about politics. And they're very anti-freedom. They're very anti-capitalism. Very anti-capitalism. In Avatar, all the characters that can be considered human are pragmatic, short-term, don't think, don't care, destructive, homicidal, nasty, horrible. That is a choice a director made. You can choose to have some characters good, some characters bad. You can choose to have, like James Cameron did in, in his early movies, a range of characters that represents a range of human behaviors and a range of human views about the world. But no, here, there's only one characterization of human. And then the one good guy who's trying to, is trying to see the value in, in this new civilization and try to bridge the gap and try to do this thing, what choice does he make at the end of the movie? He makes the choice of rejecting his humanity. He makes a choice of not being human anymore. This is worse than Dancers with Wolves and worse than Pocahontas because at the end of, end of this movie, the human being rejects his own nature and joins the Borg. He becomes something non-human, better than human beings. Avatar is a movie that, is, that, that reflects the hatred of man, the hatred of man's need to change his environment in order to survive, the hatred of man's need to progress, to advance, to enrich himself, to, 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 to become better all the time. This is a portrayal of man as, as unthinking, and, and as I said, homo, uh, homicidal and, uh, and destructive and pragmatic and uncaring, unjust. Nothing good, nothing good about humanity in this movie. No recognition of man's reason, no recognition of how he got to space, 
No recognition of what allowed him to survive in space. There's no Sigourney Weaver here. There's no Ed Harris here. There's no uh, Sarah Connor here. There are no heroes here. There's no hero. That, again, the one human being doesn't want to be human. The whole point is to get out of being human. The characters are two-dimensional. The, 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 the alien good guys are, are mystical purposefully. They're trying to be affiliated with Native Americans or Native peoples and colonizing and destroying them. But it, caricature, it, it makes it into caricature. It doesn't have an historical parallel. So this is the movie, in a sense, where Cameron has given up on human beings. He's given up on life. It, 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 it's all negative. It's all dark. It's all downhill. There's no upside. There's no redemption. There's no... There's no heroism. This is... You know, uh, James Cameron completely embracing the fatalistic, deterministic, um, you know, anti-human climate change catastrophism of the environmentalist movement, that we're worthless human beings. We, we, we should all die for the sake of some other species. So uh, Avatar was awful. I, I can't stomach going to see this new one. If, uh, if you guys tell me it's completely different than the old one and completely different theme and, and, and philosophy and direction. But what I wanted to show you here is how Cameron's philosophy evolved, how it went from being positive and pro-reason and, and the world is knowable and values are achievable to we're all rotten. Values aren't achievable, and if they are, it's not worthy because we're human beings and we're flawed and we're detestable. Right. Now, like all his other movies, it's beautifully made. It's it's amazing. Special effects are through the roof, and everything's amazing about it. it, it you know, that was true of Titanic. That's true of this. But those two movies are just horrible movies that portray a completely different sense of life, a completely different set of metaphysical values than the metaphysical values in his youth. In his 80s, James Cameron was an idealist, a pro-human idealist. But he had this flaw, obviously, his kind of, where does his leftist politics, his, his environmentalism, his, um, his anti-corporations and anti-capitalism. And I think that over time, that gnawed at him and gnawed at him and gnawed at him until that became the dominant part of what he is and, and, and what his movies represent. But you can see here the power of movies, the power of art to project a, a deep and, and, and comprehensive uh, view of man, of the world, of life. And uh, this is why I love movies, I love stories, I love art. Uh, it can really inspire. I mean, I think watching Aliens is not only suspenseful and just fun, roller coaster kind of fun. It's inspiring. The character of Sigourney Weaver is inspiring. It should want, it should inspire you to be heroic in your life. The same is true of Terminator. The same is true of, of, of I think, The Abyss. The characters are inspiring. They're rich. They're interesting. And, um, and there's a, a real sense of the world that says human beings can be good, they can survive, and to be good and to survive in all those four movies, you must use your mind. You must choose to use your mind. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. A little different, um, and, uh, and I think uh, hopefully some of you who haven't watched these movies, there weren't too many spoilers. And, um, uh, you know, uh, you, can, uh, you can go. Um, anyway, let's see. Um, let's look at the $20 questions. But I'm looking for ones that are about this first. Um, uh, oh, good God. Uh, Right. All right, this is related somewhat. 
How do you think Marvel's popularity speaks to the desire for heroism that has been missing from art? I recently tutored some kids, teens, who instead of their political art assignments, only wanted to draw Japanese magna heroes. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, kids have the strong desire for heroes. It's because kids are um, idealistic and, and, and they want models and they, they know deep down, they have a sense of their own capabilities as human beings and they want models of, of greatness. They want, they want something exciting in their lives. They hate boredom. They hate just, they, 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 they have aspirations. They have a future. It's what adults lose. And art gives them a model for that. Art projects to them what's possible. Now, sadly, the only kind of romantic vision of heroes that exists today for kids is superheroes. Now, I don't particularly like superheroes, primarily because they're super. And, and as a consequence of them being super, they are outside the actual experience of these kids. So the kids cannot aspire to be Superman. They'll never be Superman. They can't fly. They can't do the things that Superman does because he's a different being. What kids really need is old-style adventure stories of kids doing amazing things. Normal kids, not superhero kids. Kids being detectives and discovering murderers. Kids doing, going on adventures and discovering new, or, 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 or Robert Hanlein's uh, uh, novels for kids, which were kids going into space and having adventures in space and all kinds of things like that. Uh, Harry, uh, Harry Potter, but again, Harry Potter was a magician and these kids can't be magicians. It's a certain element of, you have to have, you have to have normal humans become heroes. No more kids becoming heroes. That's the best kind of literature for kids. Because then they, it's, it's a real model. It's not a, it's not a, uh, a, 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 a made up mystical science fiction model. Now, it's true that even superheroes act in this world and therefore the kids can learn from that. Uh, they certainly, I think uh, that's why Harry Potter was so successful because it, it had parallels to their own experiences the bullying, uh, the bad and good teachers, a lot of this stuff, right? Um, yeah, Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys are good examples. Uh, but headlines, if, yeah, they're books for teenagers. Teenagers are still kids. So I, I think there's definitely a, a real lack of romantic stories for children. And I, I, I think that I don't know much about Japanese Magna, but, but at least in, uh, in, 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 in the West, it's filled by uh, comics and superheroes, but I don't, think, I don't think that's good enough. I don't think it serves enough of a function. All right, um, we are about $270 short of our goal. Let's not make the James Cameron show the one way we miss our goal, right? Um, Uh, Andrew Trigger says, is there a parallel between Roy Snyder's approach to dealing with the monster in Jaws and Sigourney Weavers and Aliens? How do you regard Jaws in general? I mean, I, Jaws is, a, is good. I mean, it's interesting. It, 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 it also identifies the, the evil of pragmatism, the pragmatism this time in, in the local politicians. Um, Jaws is less menacing than Aliens. It's a lot less scary than Aliens. Um, the challenge that he faces is a lot less than the challenge Sigourney Weaver faces. And there's something about Sigourney Weaver and the way it's scripted and the, 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 the variety of different characters around her that is richer than, I think, Jaws. I think Aliens is a better movie than Jaws. Um, and I think, again, what, what, James Cam what Cameron does both in Aliens and in Abyss is presenting these different characters with different epistemological views of the world. If I'd watched the movie earlier today or a week ago, I could have actually given you all the different categories that these people had, all the different types of approaches, right? From the paranoid to the conspiracy theorist to the, to the skeptical to the, 
uh, you know, confident in reality in his own senses to the curious, all the different views of, 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 of how they're interpreting the same kind of evidence. And, and, and I don't know any other director who's done that, who's done that in that way, where literally every character is unique in that sense. And I don't think that's quite as consistent as yours. And I just don't think that it's as menacing or he is as heroic as she is in Aliens. Now, it's, Aliens is also more of an action movie than Jaws is. Um, all right, Tezzy says, thanks for this. I love movies. Favorites, favorite is Alien and True Lies. Um, I used to like Titanic as a kid, but now I cringe at it. Isn't it funny when you grow up, your values solidify and life changes, your taste change? Absolutely. I mean, your values are gonna change, your taste is gonna change. Um, you, you, you get exposed to more art, you learn more about the art, you learn more about what's possible, you learn more about your own values, you integrate those values, your emotions are now more consistent with your values. All of it is, 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 is connected and interrelated. So yes, you, hopefully your, your taste changes as you mature. It should, because you, you, know, you should be more integrated and your values should be you know, better integrated with, with, with who you are, with your soul. And therefore, your emotions should be different. Sometimes in subtle ways, sometimes in big ways. Okay, John says, do you think the aliens in these movies could be stand-ins for things like immigration and other things like opposing ideals or cultures perceived as threats to weak-minded individuals like nationalists? I don't think so. I, I think they're, they're actual aliens. I mean, you could create, uh, you could associate them. You know, the alien in aliens is a, is a parasite, and you can certainly think of parasites in the world in which we live and the danger of parasitis, parasites. But I think that's, I, I, that's reading too much. I think what's important for the movie is how menacing they are. And again, the shape, shape shifter uh, in, 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 um, in uh, Terminator 2 is, I mean, we all know shape shifters. We all know personalities that shift and, and how horrible that is. So it does have applicability in a variety of different ways. But again, one of the things I warn you of with movies and art generally is don't politicize them. That's what the left does. The left believes all art is political. Art is metaphysical. It's about metaphysical value judgments. It's the interaction between you and reality. Politics is way up there somewhere. That's essential. Even political movies are fundamentally metaphysical. Titanic, in spite of its Marxism, the fundamental of it is man's impotence in the face of nature and man's impotence to escape his own class, his own fate. It's the opposite of Terminator. There's no free will, really. And the kind of, the kind of exploitation which is inevitable in every aspect of that movie, in every, every, every place that that movie goes. So... I, I don't think you should uh, think of movies as reflecting things that are happening politically. They might. There might be some parallels. They might be interesting to think about. But that's not the essential thing about a, uh, an artwork. Essential thing about an artwork is the relationship between you and. Um, let's see. Slavok Zizik. Uh, J.J. Jigby says, in a documentary, he narrated about politics and philosophy in movies presented Titanic as a Marxist fantasy. He's right. It was my first exposure to this idea and heightened my awareness of the underlying philosophy in the film. I, had ne I didn't know that about Zizek, so I did not take this idea from Zizek. It is so visually obvious because of, the, uh, of, of just that, that shot where he goes cross-section into the boat, uh, uh, the boat and you see the, the, the wealthy lazing about doing nothing all the way down the different classes of people, all the way down to the people making their lives possible by shoveling the coal into the fire. Zizek is, is a smart dude. I mean, he had some smart things to say about Ayn Rand as well. Um, he's wrong in so many ways, on so many things. But, um, but, on, but, but, but he, he makes, often makes some really good observations. It, it, similar in that sense to... Uh, to um, uh, Jordan Peterson, just from a different 
completely different uh, perspective. Um, Richard says, I wonder if directors depict anti-business characters and themes because of their struggles with the studio budgets and marketing pressure thoughts. No, again, it's deeper than that. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sudden view of, of what making money necessitates and implies and, and it's, it's, it's not just the experience of this particular uh, budget or this particular direct, or, or, or this thing. Not at all, I don't think. It's something much deeper than that. And you can see it ultimately manifest in Titanic where he's an out Marxist, where it's deep and philosophical. Um, John asks, do you think creatives like James Cameron hate businessmen so much because the only experience with these types of men is to fund their movies, act as creative black holes who rely on formulas and conventionality? No, no, no. I think it's because they think that making money, that the process of business, that the process of making money necessitates pragmatism and necessitates a rejection of values. Many artists think this, even artists that don't interact with business. This is the direct consequence of taking ideas seriously. The ideas of the culture, the ideas of altruism, the ideas of, uh, you, you know, again, uh, 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 of, of, yeah, of altruism. And, and, and businessmen are, are egoistic. Egoistic means what? Lying, cheating, stealing, thieving. And artists get that. They see the necessity of it because that's, that's what they take morality more seriously. They think about morality more seriously than common people. So it's not because of their experience with particular people or particular system. It's because of their deeply held beliefs about the nature of man, about morality, about what the purpose of life is and, and, and what, it rep what is represented by the, 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 the people you know, uh, uh, who seek profit for themselves. And that's self-interest and selfish. And they, the creators, even though James Cameron is a very, very wealthy man. They didn't do it for the money. They did it for the, glo for the, for the, for the art. And they, they, you know, money makes you do horrible things, they believe. That's what altruism teaches them. Hopper Campbell. When the Terminator asked John, uh, John uh, Connor, why he can't kill anyone, John replies, because you just can't. This intrinsic floating abstraction justifying the human value, uh, the value of human life that cannot be perceived by reason is infuriating. Yes, I mean, there, there, there's definitely that kind of, uh, I don't know, pacifism underlying uh, some of this that undermines a little bit the character. But, um, you know, pacifist for the sake of it. But, of course, what he's telling him is you can't kill human beings. Don't kill human beings. That's a good thing. He just can't explain it. You also have to say, yeah, but he's a kid. I mean, he, he knows it's wrong to kill people, and he can't explain it. So it's not too shocking. It's not too shocking he can't do it. What's more shocking is that, what is it, Batman or Superman or both of them can't, are not allowed to kill even the most evil people around? They won't kill evil people? That's really shocking. That's pathetic. Um... Jennifer says, when I was a kid, I liked books that were supposed to be boy books, stories about boys building rockets and going to Mars on their own. Yeah, I mean, those are the kind of books that I think kids should be exposed to and, and love because they project what's possible, what's possible to us as human beings, boys and girls. Um, Adam says... I consider the best book for and about teens, Steinkowski's, I can't pronounce it, Through the Desert and Jungle. I don't think I read it. A great romantic writer, ordinary teens, teens become extraordinary. Uh, there was a bodlerized one in the 50s, but a great one remains to be filmed. Through Desert and Jungle. You guys should go get it. Adam highly recommends it. Sounds, sounds terrific. All right. Uh, we are short about $200 now. So $10, 20, uh, $10, $20 questions. Or maybe somebody could just do $200 and 
where all my all, all, uh, all of our whales have kind of disappeared. A bunch of whales have disappeared more recently. All right, Michael asks, how would you compare James Cameron to Steven Spielberg? I mean, Steven Spielberg is a great filmmaker. He knows what he's doing. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a master at the art. Um, his films, I think, are all over the place. Uh, almost all of them are beautifully made, fantastically made. But they don't have consistent themes. Um, they're not, I don't find them as engaging as, as Cameron. They, they're not as deep philosophically. Um, you, you know, if you think about, I, I, I think, I think uh, uh, Steven Spielberg's, you know, E.T. is one of his best movies that he made. And E.T. is this wondrous, benevolent, you know, fantastic story. I just saw it recently. They republished it. What was it, the 50th, 50th anniversary or something? And it was, it was uh, we saw it at the theaters. Uh, and, and it was fantastic. It was so much fun. And it's, it's got this amazing benevolence about it. And it's, it's the wonders of the universe. And, it, it, you know, Steven Spielberg has the ability to capture that wonder, particularly in his kids' movies. I think as he becomes a more serious director, serious in a sense of adult director, uh, I think it was the 40th anniversary, sorry, the 40th anniversary I recently saw. Um, I think his movies, uh, he knows what he's doing, so he can manipulate your emotions really, really well. I think I've told you I didn't particularly like, uh, was it something Private Ryan? Um, I, I, I hated Schindler's List, even though it's, 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 it's amazingly well made. I thought it was very emotionally manipulative, but maybe... That's what he wanted, right? But, but it wasn't instructive, and it wasn't particularly heroic, even though there's a hero in the movie, but it wasn't... It, 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 and I, it, it kind of downplayed his heroism. So I didn't like Saving Private Ryan. I, I don't like Schindler's List. But I understand why people like it. It's just I don't like it. Um, I couldn't, you know, it, it was too difficult to watch. Um, I like almost anything he brings out, but it's always... I like it. It's fine. Uh, the Cameron, first four movies of Cameron were exciting movies, were, were, were thrilling movies. Were, I've, I've seen them three, four times. How many of, how many of Steven Spielberg's movies have I seen three or four times? E.T.? Uh, you know, you'd have to give me a list of Steven Spielberg movies right now so I could look at it and, and, and figure out how many of them I've seen many times and what I think of them. So I think Sp Spielberg is obviously a master. Um, and, um, and, and, and very good at what he does. I just think he's less of a deep thinker and less, his movies are less important. Now, granted, most people don't think James Cameron's movies, don't see what I see in James Cameron's movies. You're gonna have to watch them to see if you agree with me or not, but most people don't see what I see in, uh, in that. Most people just go see an action movie, but that's, that's the nature of art is that the, the, I think the, the, the powerful, powerful messages, you know, are they implicit? They're not a lecture. You're inspired by them. And I think people are, were inspired by Cameron movies in the, in the 80s. Um, no, I don't want to answer that right now. Let's see. James Taylor said, would you say Terminator 2 is one of the greatest films of all time? Would Ayn Rand have liked it? I don't know. I, I, I don't like to make those kind of statements. It's one of my favorite movies. Um, you know, probably my top 20 or something like that. Um, would Ayn Rand have liked it? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what her attitude would have been to it. Um, I, I don't think she was a fan of action movies, but I really don't know. I shouldn't really uh, talk about what Ayn Rand would have liked or not. I have no clue. Um, but I certainly liked it. It's one of my Certainly makes my top 20, uh, maybe top, maybe all four of them make my top 50. Certainly my top 20 of the last 50 years since the 60s. Um, I think it's one of the better movies of, of what I consider modern times. There's so many good movies of the 30s and 40s and 50s that it's hard to rank them all. Um. Let's see. Um, 
I'm trying to look for, I'm looking for questions that relate to the movies, and then I'll get to the more general ones. I know there's a lot of them, a lot of them here. Um, uh, let's see, Michael H says, even when I was a kid and saw Avatar, I felt bad that the humans lost. Not to mention he copied another crappy movie called Dances with Wolves. Yes, but this is a lot, this was a lot worse even than Dancing with Wolves, but Dancing with Wolves was bad enough. Um, okay. Uh, okay, what do I think of Star Wars? You know, I've never been a big fan of Star Wars. I, it's, it's, the movie is very shallow. It, 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 there's not a lot of depth to it. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that the evil guy is the father of the good guy or something like that. But it, it's just, it, you know, it's fun, action, swashbuckling, but there's no real depth to Star Wars. There's, it's not that interesting. The characters are pretty two-dimensional. Um, again, fun, but, but, but very two-dimensional. There's no depth. There's no elevation of reason or, uh, you know, what it takes for human beings to survive, what it takes for human beings to be successful. Uh, Harrison Ford is just a cynic, and a, a cynic who becomes a hero. That's like, uh, that's like in every second movie out there. I mean, Harrison Ford is great, right? Because he's Harrison Ford. But it's just, um, it's just not that interesting. I watched them. It's fun, but is there any character there that's like, wow, that's an interesting character to build up? And they have had hours and hours and hours to create interesting characters, and they haven't. The characters are shallow. I, I thought the the series that was on now, um, what's the latest series on the Disney on Disney Plus? Uh, not Avatar. What, what's it called? Um, anyway, maybe one of you. The latest this, uh, the latest Star Wars kind of series within the big picture. I thought that was quite good. It was very well made. Um, uh, very Andor. Andor, I thought, was quite well. It was, it, because the characters were interesting. Because they actually developed characters, and the characters were interesting. Their motivation was interesting. They weren't caricatures. They weren't shallow. They weren't two-dimensional. Yeah, I mean, yes. Somebody says Harrison Ford is much better in Witness than in Star Wars. Absolutely. And Witness is a fabulous movie. Fabulous movie. Um... Whoops, what did I do there? Undo. Um, how do Cameron's movies compare to your favorites, such as This Land is Mine? Oh, God. I mean, that's not really a fair comparison. I, I mean, This Land is Mine is, is, is one of my favorite all-time movies. Um, you know, I, I think I get a lot more out of it. It's because it's not an action movie. It's because it's 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 a it's an intellectual movie. It's all about character. It's all about how a character changes through the movie. I mean, there are some changes in the characters in uh, in Cameron's movies, but not really. Um, uh, this land is mine. Is I think one of the greatest one of the, one of the greatest and best stories ever. And and it, the power of it is Charles Lawton. Charles Lawton's just genius acting. Uh, but his, um, his, Charles Lawton's capacity to use his body and his face, he's not a heroic type, he's a big, fat schlob, right? But to transition in his posture, in the way he talks, in the way he holds himself, from the beginning of the movie to the end of the movie when he becomes a hero, it's just mind-boggling. It's just the kind of acting you, you just can't imagine. It's not Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? So, um, uh, in, in, um, it's just a, it's, it's a better movie because it doesn't rely on action to drive your attention. It relies on, uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, on characters. And I think that's much more powerful. And, it, and of course it has beautiful cinematography. This is Jean Renoir, one of the great French directors of, the 30s and 40s. Uh, this is Jean Renoir. The, the cinematography is amazing. The story, the acting, it all comes together. It, it's just a, uh, it's, it's much better. So this thing is mine is top five. As I said, Cameron's movies are top 50 all time. Uh, still great movies, but, but not, not, in the same, not in the same league, I don't think. Um, 
Oops. Uh, let's see. JJ Jigby says the Slavok Zizik documentary I referred to is called The Pervert's Guide to Ideology, which, despite upputting title, is actually quite an enthralling film. Uh, I'll actually have to, I, I want to see that because I find, I actually find much of some of what Zizik says in a crazy way interesting. He has interesting observations about things. Um, so, um, thank you, uh, Zigbees. Um, yeah, uh, Taisy says, also, don't you love how uh, James Cameron has these great female action leads? They drive much of the narrative while everyone calls them crazy. Yes. I mean, Sarah O'Connor... Um, uh, Sigourney Weaver's character and uh, the character in um, The Abyss are all amazing female characters. The exact opposite of the female character in Titanic, which is a nothing empty nothingness. These three characters are heroes who drive the plot, who drive everything in the movie. Their f action, thinking, Ripley is the name of the Sigourney Weaver character. But yes, I mean, great female characters, some of the best female characters, certainly in, act, in, the, in the realm of action, uh, out there. All right, we've got a $100 question from John. Uh, thank you so much for this episode you're on. Have you seen the movie Parasite or Snowpiercer? They're both by the same director, but I don't remember his name. I think Snowpiercer is about feudalism. The main character fights his way to the front of the train that contains all that's left of humanity but then discovered that it's just the back of the train. That's all it is, that it was all a plot. No, it's all a plot that, that moving up to the front of the train is just, is just, a, it's just a game. It's, it's not real, and that he has to go, he goes all the way to the back. It, it's, it's all one big conspiracy. Um, yes, I've seen both Snowpiercer and Parasite. Uh, they're both philosophically horrible movies. It's really, really, really bad. Uh, Parasite, and I can't remember the theme of Parasite. I did a whole show on Parasite. So if you're interested in my views on Parasite, just do on YouTube, Yaron Brook, Parasite. And there, I did a whole movie review of the movie. I can't remember the theme, but, 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 but you know, inequality plays a big role in this. And, uh, and, and the, the, again, there's beautiful shots of where some people live and where other people live and, and, and the, the poor and parasite live under the underground and of course in the house uh, the guy lives in, the, in, in, in like a secret basement underground so there's a whole place it's a very well made movie Parasite is very well made very clever but at the end of the day it's, 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 it's a horrible philosophy it's also you know guys that die at the end and I, I wish I remembered my analysis at the time, which I thought was quite brilliant, and uh, was was um, had a really interesting theme that went way beyond inequality uh, in terms of parasite. But parasite is fundamentally an anti-man, anti-human being movie, um, and and so is Snowpiercer. Snowpiercer is an awful movie. It's a movie about again a kind of deterministic movie about the futility of life, and Parasite has a similar theme of the futility of life. You can like it. It's just, I'm just telling you what it means, what it, what it's, what it's, what the theme of the movie is. It was not a, it, it's not a dark comedy. It's, it's, I mean, it's a dark comedy, but it has a profound meaning to it. And that meaning is very much, um, represents a, a particular attitude towards life. It's very deterministic. Um, what are your favorite love movies? God, love movies. Love movies. Queen Christina. Queen Christina is definitely one of my favorite lo uh, movies, generally, and love movies. Um, God, I'm, not, I'm really bad at this unless you give me a, a kind of a list. I, I, need to see a, I need to see a list of movies, and then I can kind of categorize it. Yeah, Queen Christina's with Greta Garbo. Uh, almost silent. Not quite silent, but almost. Black and white. Um, Shop Around the Corner, I've mentioned that as my favorite Christmas movie. It's certainly a love movie. Uh, Shop Around the Corner. Um, ah, I, I, you know. Yeah, uh, looking at movies you guys are recommending. 
Um, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't have a list in front of me. Um, and I've never categorized movies as love stories because I've, I've got a list of my favorite movies in different genres. I'd have to look at that list. I don't have it right in front of me. I should have opened it. Uh, but uh, I could probably pick out the love movies out of those. Okay. All right. I think I, I, I never saw La La Land. Uh, you've got Mail is cute, but the real, the original is much better. Um, shop around the corner. All right, we've got a bunch of additional questions, and we, uh, we have made our goal for today, so thank you, guys. Uh, these are unrelated to movies. Um, I'm going to go through these relatively fast because we are 9.45, so we're, we're an, hour, an hour 45 minutes in, and it's late over here. Here's another movie question. Thoughts on movies like Hackshaw Ridge that are, despite being religious, are very pro-humanity. I've never seen Hackshaw Ridge. That's unusual. Somebody asked me about a movie that I haven't seen. I, I haven't seen Hackshaw Ridge. J.J. Um, Jigby says, uh, on love movies, have you seen Brief Encounter, early David Lean film, absolute masterpiece? I have because I've seen pretty much every David Lean movie, but I can't remember. It's too... Yeah, I just can't remember. Sorry. It didn't leave, obviously, a super strong impression, for whatever that means. J.G. Gbiz also says, Treasure Island is a masterpiece of children's adventure literature. Lewis Stevenson is generally great. Every kid should have a copy. I agree. I agree. Lewis Stevenson is great. Three Musketeers, that's another one that's really good. Yes, I answered the $200 question. Yeah. Have you seen the movie Parasite Dystopia? So that was the $200 one. All right. All right, non-movie questions. God, this is going to be hard. Shift mindset. Yeah, but that's the thing about the Iran Book Show. I don't know in any other show, really. I don't know any other show which covers the range of topics that we cover here. I think that's a virtue. All right. Anyway, tonight I'm working for, I'm working for the super chat. I'm working for it. All right. Michael says, "How do you have so much patience for dishonest question statements during debates?" I recently rewatched a debate with Sam Cedar, and the superficial nonsense he uh, threw at you was nauseating, but you didn't lose your cool. Yeah. What's the point? I mean, what's the point of losing your cool? You're not. You don't care about the person you're debating. Obviously, the person you're debating, you disagree with, you don't like, you think, you think they're wrong. You're trying to impress the audience. You're trying to get a point across the audience. You're trying to convince somebody to change their mind, not the guy you're debating. So you go into the debate with a mindset of, it's not about the person I'm debating. I don't have a problem insulting them. I don't have a problem arguing with them. I don't have a problem disagreeing with them. I, I'm not going to get too excited by them. I want to convey to the audience that there are better alternative ideas and to come follow me. Michael says, also, all the leftists attack you in the comment section only left one sentence long comments. It's as if they're incapable, unwilling to think deeply and have been trained to get triggered and attacked when commanded. Yeah, but again, they're not the audience. The audience is people who are open to having their mind changed. In every one of those debates, somebody comes up to me years later and tells me, that changed me. Every single one of those. Can you help end a holiday dispute explaining how Milken got railroaded and defended, defending junk bonds? Look, the best way to do that is to buy my book, Mall Case for Finance, my book with Don Watkins. It explains that in detail. It's so hard to do something like that in, 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 uh, kind of on one foot. Michael Milken was a great innovator. Junk bonds are just high-yield bonds. They're a way to raise capital. The reality is that the entire telecommunications industry in the United States, all of it, from the first fiber optics cable into the ground to the first cell phone companies to, to, to every aspect of the cell phone business was ultimately funded by uh, so-called junk bonds, by high-yield bonds by, by, uh, that were issued by Michael Milken. 
Uh, the hostile takeovers that, 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 that these high yield bonds were used in order to raise the capital, to take over conglomerates and, and, and uh, you know, split them up, um, you know, increased efficiency of the American, of American economy, increased our wealth, uh, you know, made us all richer, made us all better. Uh, Milken was railroaded by Giuliani and, and, and his, uh, the people who followed Giuliani. Uh, from the beginning of Giuliani's term, he was after Milken. They did everything they could to try to catch him. And in the end, they made up charges against him. Uh, some of them he probably committed, but they're so minor. If he was anybody else but Michael Milken, he would have got a slap on the wrist. Uh, but he got 10 years in jail for them, uh, literally to make an example of him. Uh, Michael Milken is one of the great heroes of the 20th century. Uh, second, you know, one of the two greatest financiers in history, maybe him and, and J.P. Morgan, certainly in America. J uh, and if you want to ask, I mean, that's, I could do a whole show. So if you really want to get into it, ask me again when there's more time and we're more on topic so that my mind is there. Uh, how do you cultivate a desire for curiosity and truth-seeking in a brain-dead culture? Once truth becomes a category for most people, becomes a category for most people, objectives can latch on until then, it's like trying to administrate and administer, administer medicine today. I mean, this is why you have to get people when they're young. You have to get them when they're teenagers or when they're early 20s. They still care about the truth. They're still uh, somewhat idealistic. They're still going out there and trying to discover what's real. It, 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 they're open to ideas. This is why it's so important to get the youth, because exactly that. Once they give up on the truth, forget it. What do you make of Canada's new assisted suicide law? Seems these socialized medical systems are looking to cut costs by making it easier for terminally ill and mentally ill patients to choose suicide as an option. I mean, I, don't, I haven't looked carefully at that law, but generally I am favorable towards uh, uh, medically assisted suicide. I wish it was readily available in the United States. I, I think there is a danger of combining it with socialized medicine and therefore an incentive to kill you off in order to save costs. But in a private system, it should be readily available. It should be completely legal as long as the right, you know, it's clear that it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a choice. Uh, suicide should be easy for old people. I mean, the, the, the fact that we've extended life so much, but not always have we managed to extend the quality of life for some people. Um, I mean, it's just horrible, the kind of life some old people live. And they know it, and they would want to die, but, you know, jumping off a building or jumping off a bridge, it's hard, and some of them don't have the, 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 the physical capabilities of doing it, or if they've got dementia, they, 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 they can't do it. It would be great if you could, if you could go to your doctor when you're 80-something, when you're just on the verge of getting to that place of desperation and take a pill and die. I mean, it's just, it just to me, seems so easy and obvious, it's, it, the only objection to, to, to assisted suicide, in my view, is religion. There is no objection. If you know people who are in their 90s, and I mean, some of them are great, and, but some of them are really struggling, and, and it's really hard, and, it's, 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 and they don't have an out. They don't have an easy out. And if you take pills, you have to take enough pills, and then you, you, if, if you don't actually die, it, it screws you up. It, it's, just, it's just a horrible, this should be just a pill that you take and you die. Little cyanide capsules for old people. It shouldn't be illegal. Andrew says, thank you, $50, really appreciate it. I felt the fountainhead was dark on first read, a hero in pain against the world, but Rand said it was the least morbid book ever written, a clue I was missing, I was missing something, a better sense of life, which improved with a stronger sense of individualism. Yes, I think that's right. I think you, you projected that dark sense of life onto the book because the book is a heroic achievement of heroic achieving and while he is struggling, never letting, he never lets it get him down. He's laughing. As he's kicked out of college, he's laughing. So, um, yes, great observation. It's, it's your values that change, and therefore what you, what, what you, you can now more objectively, you can now better respond to what's in the book. Thank you, guys. Thanks for the support. 
Um, okay, short answers to short questions. Harper says, are Jews more influenced by Aristotle? Oh, God, big historical questions for five bucks. Uh, <laughs> Uh, are Jews more influenced by Aristotle while Christians and Muslims are more influenced by Plato? Uh, yes, but it's complicated because Jews are only influenced by Aristotle post Maimonides. Maimonides was a huge influence on uh, Jewish culture and Jewish learning, and he was an Aristotelian. There were Aristotelians among the Muslims, but they were basically uh, discredited and shoved to the side. Uh, by, uh, by later generations. They weren't religious enough, so, so they were abandoned. Um, and of course, in Christianity, you have Thomas Aquinas, so there's a certain sense in which Aristotle has a huge impact on Christianity, certainly in certain stages and among, uh, among Catholics. And then there's a repudiation of Aristotle because he is associated with Catholicism, and the Reformation is, an, is kind of a rejection of Aristotle, even though there's some senses in which, well, I mean, the Reformation is, Protestantism is, is a mess. But um, there's certainly a repudiation of Aristotle because of uh, his, his association with um, Catholicism. Harper Campbell, is rationalism more dangerous and prevalent among today's intellectuals or is empiricism? I think among objectivists, it's certainly rationalism. Among, I think, I think, in the culture, it's more empiricism. Hopper Campbell says, are you glad Biden's president because he won't do anything nutty and buys us time? I'm not glad he's president. I'm glad Trump isn't president, put it that way. But there could have been a, 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 a not nutty Republican who could be better than Biden. There could be a Democrat who's better than Biden. So I'm not particularly happy with Biden. I'm just happy it's not Trump for that reason. Uh, James Taylor says, how much dollars is the condo you want in Austin? It can't be too expensive. I assume Texas is relatively cheap. It's not a Manhattan condo. Uh, the, the condo I saw, the, the building, condos, the cheapest condo is going for $4.1 million. That, I think, answers your question. Um, Michael says, would you ever review American History X? It seems like a good movie you would enjoy examining. It deals with racism and Nazis. I surely would, you know, I, I, I'm not particularly motivated right now, but for 500 bucks, I'll, I review the Idiocracy. I certainly will review other stuff as well. Um, Liam says, how does, it, how does it make you feel when people tell you you have changed their lives? Is it a burden or relief? Why would it be a burden or relief? It's invigorating. It's invigorating. It's, it makes me happy. It makes me, it makes me uh, uh, have a positive view of, um, of the world, of, of our chances of, to win. Uh, all right. Uh, Armin comes in with a, uh, with a song request. I know I'm way behind on songs, on music. And I've got a whole album I'm supposed to do. And I'm way behind, so I apologize. Um, but uh, Baraye, uh, could you review the song Baraye? Yes. If I, if I just Google the song, it will come up, I assume. But yes, I will do that. Thank you for the $100. Really appreciate that. Um, all right, Michael. Uh, what percentage of people who call themselves objectivists today don't actually understand the philosophy or haven't deeply integrated into their psyche? I don't know. 80? Majority. Um, Upper Campbell, have you ever been fired from a job? What would make you quit a job? Yeah, I was basically fired uh, from being a professor. I wasn't, I, I wasn't given tenure, which is basically being fired. Um, what would make me quit a job? Lots of things. Not liking it, not enjoying it, not like my boss. Not, but I've never had a boss. I've never, well, I had a boss once. I, I, I haven't had a lot of jobs in my life where I've had bosses. I've usually been my own boss. It's most of my career has been enterprises that I've partnered with other people to create and to build. I've, I've, run a, I've, I've created a bunch of different, all small little businesses, nothing, you know, no big tech startups, but um, I've never actually worked for somebody. 
not really, except for my first job as a construction manager where I worked a full time where I worked for a guy, but he, he treated me like his partner because there were only the two of us. Michael says, aging is an extraordinary process where you become the person you always should have been. That's kind of, yes, I think that's right. But also your body starts giving way. That, that's the sucky thing about aging. You're like, you have all this wisdom and knowledge and capabilities, and yet your body is not quite keeping up or, or actually deteriorating. Harper says, the most important thing I discovered for Ayn Rand is that philosophy is not just moving words around and try to win arguments. It's about winning life. Yes, excellent. Uh, Jay Jigbees, can you speak on the park where, where young Kana orders three Terminator, the Terminator not to kill? Oh, yeah, I said, I, 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 he said not to kill human beings. Human beings in that story are not the enemy. Why would you kill human beings? Now, he can't explain why. He can't explain to the machine what the value of humans to his life is, but he tells him not to kill because they're human beings. They're not the enemy. Their survival is not being threatened by human beings at this point. There's no reason to kill. And Kana, young Kana, respects human life. So I, I, I think it's a, I think it's good. It, it, it could have benefited from an, a, a, a better explanation, a short explanation, a, even an explanation that Cyborg couldn't have understood, but something. Um, Ryan said, can I watch tonight? Thanks for all the great shows lately. Appreciate it, Ryan. Jigby says, sorry for the typos you're on. Typing on my phone, no problem. John says, my dad is a Paris, a, the dad in Parasite gave his son this whole speech about not desiring more in life is the attitude of the dad basically that of the Stoic? I don't know enough about Stoicism. I think so. I'm going to have Aaron Smith on at some point uh, to talk about Stoicism, and uh, we can ask him that question. But uh, yes, that's part of the theme of the movie is don't strive. Don't try. And it's not pro the poor, because the poor are portrayed as scumbags. It's not pro the rich. The rich are portrayed as scumbags. It's not pro anybody. It's just life sucks, kind of. Do you like some Mel Brooks, Brooks, Mel Brooks, Mel Gibson's early work? I love Mad Max, the first, and I, I mean, I love all three, really, even the, the more modern one. I love Mad Max movies. I, I think they're terrific. The, the first one's hard, but, but they're all good. Um, Mrs. Suffel, I can't remember. The Year of Living Dangerous is excellent. Gallipoli is excellent. The Bounty's excellent. The River's good. Tequila Sunrise is fun. Uh, yeah, I like, I like Mel Brooks's early movies. Absolutely. They were, you know, uh, really good dramas. You have Living Dangerously is really thoughtful drama. Mad Max is a really clever science fiction. Um, uh, end of the world, you know, uh, a dystopia movie. Um, I think those were breakthrough movies as well in terms of the way they were shot, the way they were made. They, 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 they were the beginning of something. Um, the three Mad Max movies. Um, they were new. When you saw them, you'd never seen anything like them. They were truly breakthroughs. Um, yeah, all those movies I enjoy. So I, I, I definitely liked uh, Mel Gibson when he was young. Whew. All right, two hours, two hours and three minutes. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, I remind you that on December 31st, we're having a big show, uh, uh, year in review, looking forward to next year. We've got a, um, a uh, match, a super chat match. Uh, I've, got, I've got a anonymous contributor who will match every dollar we raise up till 10,000, um, up until $10,000. So it'll be, it could potentially be the biggest, uh, you know, super chat night ever in uh, your own book show history. Uh, you know, I think the biggest night we've had is $6,000. So we're going to go for $10,000. It's going to be a long show. It'll be two, three hours long easily. So come prepared. Bring your wallet. Um, and uh, why anonymous? Because they would rather stay anonymous um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and, um, but it's real. It's, I'm not making this up. It really is a person. Uh, you'll have to believe me. $10,000. So... Uh, 31st, 
It's a Saturday. We'll be starting at 2 p.m. Eastern time and going for as long as it takes. Well, we probably won't go more, more than three hours, but for as long as it takes to get $10,000. So please join me then. In the meantime, thanks, guys. I appreciate the love. appreciate the support. Hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to like the show before you leave. Don't forget to do all the things that help the algorithm. And I will see you tomorrow morning.